Welcome back to the show. Our next guests are award-winning journalists who have spent the better part of the last two and a half years investigating women in the workplace. Not only did they find that women are out-earned, we are also outranked and outnumbered at Canada's most important institutions. Please welcome from the Globe and Mail's Power Gap series, investigative journalist Robin Doolittle and data journalist Chen Wang. Hello to you both. Hi. Hi there. All right, Chen, I'd like to start with you first, because I think that sort of anecdotally among women, we discuss experiences with gender discrimination in the workplace. But you are a data journalist. You're about the hardcore numbers. And that's where I want to start with, because you actually comb through the salaries of 90,000 public sector workers. And so let's connect the data with how important it is in communicating the severity of the problem of inequality in the workplace. Yeah, I think data set a very solid foundation for our series and also help us to point to where to dig deeper to flesh out the findings with personal stories. Um, because I want to point out, like, when we are talk about uh, like the wage gap and the gender equality, it can get personal sometimes. And, and like people tend to be understanding things based on their personal experiences or experiences of people around them. And we heard from people saying that, oh, I don't know any female who's paid less than their male colleagues, or I'm a female and I'm tired of being regarded as a victim in this because I never experienced the sexism in my career. So I think mm -hmm. this is when data bring in the big picture and allow us to to look at the issues beyond personal experiences and also help us to quantify and visualize those abstract metaphors and answer questions, where is those glass ceiling and sticky floor in each organization and provide this undeniable fact that like these issues carry across many entities and many pillars. And maybe now we can stop arguing, do these issues really exist and move on to answer the question, like, what, what can actually be done about the wage gap and a lack of women in the critical decision making? Robin, you know, the word glass ceiling gets thrown around a lot when we start talking about women in the workplace. But uh, for some people, that concept really is uh, a term that is used for a lot of white women in particular, particularly in the C-suites and those executive positions. But the data goes deeper than all of this, because you, what did it show you about not only uh, women from all pay scales, uh, but all racial backgrounds as well. I think there's two big things with the glass ceiling that we found. And the first is that the glass ceiling is much lower than, uh, than what we talk about. We think about the glass ceiling as being at the president's office. But what our numbers showed is that women are hitting the glass ceiling as mid-level managers. And that's a really important um, element of this investigation, because when you only focus at the very top, you're missing the point. Women can't get to the top because they can't get through the middle. And then the other point that you brought up, which mm. is just so crucial, we looked at the number of, of BIPOC women who made it to the very top, those who were in the one percentile mm -hmm. of earners and those who were the presidents of their companies or deputy ministers, university presidents, city managers. And here's the thing. Of the very few women who make it through, they're almost entirely white. Of something like um, more than a thousand people in this category, only 27 women were women of color. And I think that that is a, a huge piece of the story that we need to understand as well. You know, when I was going through the series, one of the things that jumped out at me was universities. So we tend to think of universities as places of higher learning where equality and progress happen. But your research uh, indicated that academia was uh, actually had the worst track record. So Chen, uh, can you explain what you found and how these institutions are reacting to being called out? So universities share a very similar pattern across the board that they tend to be pretty even just above the 100K uh, disclosure threshold, like 50-50. But when we up, like women representation will like a slowly decline at the very top. Women are easily outnumbered by three to one or four to one. And regarding responses, like we've received the most probably like the most like pushback from uh, universities, like when we were examining the executive power position of each organization, like some university want us to like go to lower ranking job titles, not just like to include like president, vice president, provost, uh, vice provost, but also include like assistant, a social vice president, uh, and also like a deans. And based on what I just described, like it's pretty obvious, obvious like the lower you go, the more women 
then you will be able to include in the calculation. And the question becomes, like, do they really think like those all job titles are entitled with the same executive power, or do they just want to look better in record? You know, Robin, that's the data, and then there's the ripple effect of those facts, which is how it affects everybody else. I think when you think about universities in particular, these are the institutions that educate the next generation and also that help Canadians understand themselves and their country. We rely on universities to do the research and to tell us what's happening. And universities allocate billions in funding dollars, and they also decide who's doing that research. So what topics are being studied? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that, that just always jumps out at me that I hear over and over again from experts, what we know is that women are more likely to get injured in car accidents. And what we also know is that the default crash test dummy that is used to test car safety is a man, the body of a man, right? Mm -hmm. And this ripple effect goes across our society that the default is man. And there are actual health consequences to that. So that's the other layer of this, mm -hmm. the lack of women in decision-making roles. So Robin, I think that I'm not the only one who's maybe naive enough to believe that there are like rules, workplace laws that uh, protect women from gender discrimination. What did you find out about this? I think there's an impression out there that women still aren't getting fired for becoming pregnant. And they are. Uh, we have all the laws mm -hmm. that you could possibly need in Canada wow. to prevent gender discrimination in the workplace. They are, they've been on the books for decades. And the thing is, there's just no real way to enforce them. Um, the, the court system that was set up to handle discrimination cases, the Human Rights Tribunal, is dramatically underfunded and under-resourced. The wait times to get there for a hearing is like on average two to four years, but I interviewed people who it went wow. much longer than that. There's one woman, it waited a decade. And the thing is, the damages that you can win at human rights tribunals are very low. They're between like five and $30,000 mm. and they don't cover your legal fees if you win. So imagine how much a lawyer costs if you're fighting these things. And the result of this is that women are choosing not to bother because they have these huge risks of speaking out. There's retribution, it's cost, it's time, it's money, it's not moving yeah. on. And what they do is they sign settlement agreements. And settlement agreements almost always include some form of confidentiality clause, or in the States they're called yeah. NDAs, which is what we're familiar with. So these same NDA agreements that were silencing Harvey, Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein's accusers have also been resolving all manner of gender discrimination complaints in Canada, from pregnancy or promotion, sexism, pay equity. We uncovered all of it. And what the other side of this is, is that you never hear about it. It's obscuring our understanding of mm -hmm. how common this is, because companies never have to change because it's all done in secret. Wow. This is clearly impacting women negatively, but what has your research found about how all of this impacts men, Robin? This is, I think, a really key point that I just want to scream over and over again. The status quo hurts everyone, including men, and not just men who care about their daughters and wives and sisters and friends that are women. Um, the status quo rewards a very old school, traditional style of leader. And that leader is someone who's overly confident yes. and aggressive and authoritative. Over and over again, when people are asked to draw mm -hmm. leaders, they draw men. And this is one of the things that, that hurts women in trying to rise. But what about men who stray from those very traditional uh, characteristics? Research has shown that men who exhibit behaviors such as being kind and supportive um, are more likely to earn less than their male colleagues. A male leader who asks for mm. help is viewed as less competent. What a scary thought to think that male leaders are not in a position to be able to yeah. ask for help. The current system also assumes men are less devoted to their children and love their children less than women. Um, and men, there's actually research that shows that men are penalized more harshly for taking time off 
to be with their kids. We have a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> Jen, you were largely limited to accessing public sector records because of privacy rules. So what are experts saying about whether or not your findings will be reflected in the private sector? Experts and uh, economists reviewed our data tell us that uh, like uh, these patterns are most likely to replicate it in the private sector or even worse. And that's why I really want to highlight the importance of data transparency because basically it's the best leverage that women could ask for to understand our positions in the workplace and to understand if we're really being treated equally as we thought we would be. Isn't that the truth? Information, data, transparency. Wow, both of you, uh, thank you so much for being here, but mostly for the work that you've put in. I know that you've worked on it for a long, long time, and this is such vital information. We, we so appreciate you sharing it. And don't forget, the Globe and Mail's Power Gap series will be continue to rolling out uh, all over uh, through the rest of the year, and uh, we encourage you to keep an eye on it. And listen, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much to get to, which is why uh, Robin and Chen have been so gracious to do an Instagram Live with me. And we're going to continue to delve deeper into their investigative work. So please catch that on the socials, Instagram, TV, IGTV page. That's at the social CTV. We'll be right back after this.